This is the day that God has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. My friends, welcome to this service of Rockingham and Fairview United Churches on this last Sunday of June. I am Reverend Sarah Rayburn, and this is my friend and colleague, the Reverend Angela McLean. And we are so glad that each of you are here. Welcome to all of you. If you wouldn't mind, please take a moment and just let us know you're here in the comments section. Gives us a fuller sense of being the body of Christ together if we have a, a few of the names of the people who are out there. Whether you comment or not, welcome. We're glad you're here. I echo that welcome. We are super glad that you are here. And I would just like to give you a kind reminder that if you are feeling nudged to give financially to either Rockingham United Church or Fairview United Church, that that can be done through PAR, e-transfers, Canada Helps, or mailing in your checks. We realize that this has been a difficult time financially for many, including churches who have taken a hit financially in their weekly offerings. If you are suffering at all financially, please know that this message is not for you and you continue to be held in our prayers. On behalf of both Rockingham United and Fairview United Church, I want to express our deepest gratitude for your generosity in these uncertain times. Absolutely. So some Rockingham announcements this morning. I first of all want to give a huge shout out to Kathy Stone. Kathy has been teaching and inspiring a love of music in young children for many years. And this week she is retiring. Congratulations, Kathy. We wish you all the best. And from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you from not retiring from Rockingham, only from the school system. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, lots of love to you today. Uh, coffee and conversation is happening right after the service today. You are welcome to join in. The Zoom link will be posted in the comments section. It's also on both of our websites, I believe. So um, find it, whoever you are. You are more than welcome. Come, come meet us and chat with us after the service. Uh, the Wednesday afternoon coffees have ended for Rockingham. Uh, this coming Wednesday is Canada Day. It's a holiday, and we're going to stop them for the summer, summer months. Um, I have some exciting news today. We've been talking the last couple of weeks about having a job available. It's no longer available. Um, we have interviewed a number of applicants, and the most qualified of the applicants was Evan Thorne. So, Evan, welcome to the team. We're happy to have you on staff. Um, I know your supervisor will keep you in line. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations to you, and thank you for all the work you're going to do for us, because we really appreciate it and need it. Other exciting opportunities. Um, if you are interested in tech, we are looking to expand our tech team. We're hoping to keep streaming once we uh, go back into our sanctuaries, hopefully sometime this century. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so we're looking for uh, more people who would willing, be willing to be involved with streaming, with decision and policy making, with, um, with uh, where are my words? Um, with the PowerPoints and present, uh, um, putting them together so that they're beautiful on Sunday mornings. Um, however you want to be involved, if you uh, see that this is a ministry that you would be interested in, we are happy to have you on board. Please just email the office and let us know you're interested or spread a rumor to someone and uh, we'd be uh, more than happy to welcome you. I think the next announcement is going to be exciting about uh, vacations. Mm -hmm. Someone I know is going on a vacation soon, and yep. I am going to miss you, but wish you well. I'm going to miss you too, absolutely. So I am be I'll be on vacation for July the 5th, the 12th, and the 19th, first three weeks of July, and you will be in very good hands with the Reverend Sarah Rayburn, and if there's any... Um, pastoral emergencies, please call Rockingham United Church, and uh, Sarah will absolutely be happy to be in touch with you as soon as she possibly can, and um, I'm going to sort of be here. Time travel, isn't it great? The time traveling, the you're going to see me. modern technology. You're going to see me, even though I'm on vacation, I won't be there, but I will be there, and you're, of course, you're always in my thoughts, so anyway, yes, so I have a vacation coming up um, first three weeks of July, and I'm um, very much looking forward to that. I want to wish each and every one of you a really happy, safe summer as we embark on the summer season. I think um, 
it's all very well deserved from everybody and congratulate everybody on getting through these last three months. God knows it's been difficult on many levels for everybody from dealing with isolation to learning how to do church in new ways and all kinds of stuff. So I just want to thank all of you for, for being there and doing what you do in times of crises. Really good news. Do you remember those 297 boxes that everybody, or act everybody, I should say, Laurel Walker coordinated and spearheaded on behalf of the church and all Nova Scotians, really? Those boxes have been delivered and they were received gratefully by the crew of the HMCS Fredericton on, I think it was June 17th. And I have received a beautiful little thank you note from the captain, Brenda Zwicker, she is the padre of the ship. And Captain Zwicker says this, hello, on behalf of HMCS Fredericton, I wanna thank you for the gift boxes you sent to the crew. We had many very excited young sailors getting packages and the crew was amazed that any group would take on such a big project for us. The morale, certain, the morale mail certainly lived up to its name as we enjoyed opening the boxes and finding many surprises inside. I had the photo tech take a picture after we had the boxes sorted out, but before we handed them out, and I have attached it here for you. Blessings. Captain Brenda Zwicker. Now that photo will be found shortly on our Facebook um, page. You'll be able to see it. So I just wanted to give a shout out to everybody who was involved in that and um, brought a lot of hope to a lot of people. So that's fantastic news. Other than that, I think that's it. Just check in on our Facebook page over the summer for anything new that might be happening. And uh, I want to give a huge thank you to Tamara, our office administrator over these past weeks. She's also on vacation for the summer and she'll be back with us in September. So Tamara, we hope you have a fantastic summer. And I just want to say again, you know, I'm, I'm covering Angela. So Fairview folks out there, if you need me, don't hesitate to call. Um, if you call the Rockingham United Church office, uh, or check the website. Um, there are phone numbers there where you can reach me 24-7, not mm -hmm. directly, because, you know, but whoever answers the phone will be happy to put you in touch with me. So um. Awesome. And you'll be in very good hands. So that's great. Thank you, Sarah. I You're appreciate welcome. that. I should send you those numbers so you can put them on the Fairview phone as well. Yeah, yep. absolutely. We'll do that. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, let us turn our hearts and our minds um, more deeper into God's love and affection for us as we look for our affection towards God as well. As we sing together, Voices United 374, come and find the quiet center.
Friends, as we gather here this morning, we, we, uh, light, we take our candle and we light the Christ candle to remind us that no matter who we are or where we are or what kind of road we are traveling in life, whether it's in joy or in sorrow or sadness and grief, the light of Christ is always in our midst. We thank you for this, O oh God. Amen. Our hearts are weighed down by the attachments that we have in this life. And as we enter this time of worship, may we exhale our worries and inhale the Spirit of God that surrounds us. May we find here a space for release and reflection, a space to empty our souls and create refuge for Sabbath rest. Mm. How long, O oh Lord? How long must we hold on to this pain? How long will the aches of our souls have power over our hearts? How long must we bear the weights of worry, of guilt, and of sorrow? Move beyond the past that holds us captive. We will move forward despite the scars. May God's steadfast love heal our spirits. May God's steadfast love help us discover the road to salvation. Let us sing with renewed voices. Let us sing the divine uh, generosity. Please join me in prayer. Holy one in whom we bear our souls, we take comfort and courage in your presence through your love and light. We are able to explore what it takes to place our trust entirely with you, in you. Help us lovingly put you before all else as we journey the corridors of uncertainty knowing that your steadfast love shepherds us on paths unknown. Amen. The psalm reading for this morning comes to us from the book of Psalms, Psalm number 13. I'll be reading from the New International Version. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fail. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. May God add his blessing to the psalm reading this morning. Wasn't the psalm that Lisa just read for us lovely? It was perfect for these days. I love it. How long, O oh Lord? a refrain that I think a lot of us have been feeling over the last few months. How long our Lord has been calling out to us and it's been our cry in many ways recently. The writer of the psalm is clearly going some, through something really painful and the writer of the psalm feels that there has been a huge injustice. We don't know what it is, but we, we know that the writer feels that something horrible has been done by someone else to the writer. I'm going to say him because chances are back in that day. Um, and so the writer right, calls out, how long? How long is this going to go on? How long am I going to feel this way? How long is this going to persist? How long is this fool going to be oppressing me? How long? The Black Lives Matter, the Indigenous Lives Matter movement cries out the same thing, don't they? How long? And it's the cry of people everywhere who've been pushed to the margins again and again and again. But it's interesting because built into the question is something really precious. When we cry out, how long, there's a trust in there that all of this is one day going to end, that things are going to be different. It's not whether or not this is going to end but when. 
There's a trust that someday things are going to be different and it will end. We just don't know when that day is. The day is taking too long, isn't it? But there's an absolute trust built in here that it will come. And we've been sitting in a isolation in COVID-19, also crying out, how long? And it feels like, at least in Canada, it feels like that day is beginning to dawn, doesn't it? That the how long is actually arriving. I'm preaching this a few days ahead of you seeing it, and I have to say, I find that really cool because it means I can be online with you uh, in the comments, um, talking to you, being with you uh, on Sunday morning. So I, I like that. But the danger of that, of course, is that what I'm about to say is going to be wrong by Sunday. <laughs> But as I preach, it's been two weeks and no new cases of COVID-19. Yay! How long? Not long at all. How fantastic is that? And I know there's a whole lot of reasons that we've got to this point, And it's complex and it's a whole variety of things. But you know, one of those things that has brought us to this point where we can say no COVID-19 in two weeks is our behavior with one another. We can say, you know, back in the three months ago when we were crying out how long, we started doing things to make sure that it wouldn't be long if we had anything to do with it. And we all know it's hugely out of our control, but partly in it as well. And even as I speak, the World Health Organization is saying the numbers are going up globally, not down. So, you know, for now, we'll take it, we'll take it. But the whole reason that we've stayed the blazes home for three months, the reason that we now wear masks when we go out in public and still tend to stand two meters away from one another is not so much to keep ourselves safe, but to keep us all safe. I mean, I wear a mask out in public because I want to keep the most vulnerable people in our society safe. Um, I know my mask does not protect me, but it protects others. And when we all engage in that kind of behavior that says, I care what happens to you and to you and to you, to all of us, then we're all safer, aren't we? And we've done that. I absolutely love living in a province that cares about community, where we take precautions because we do value each other and where we want the most vulnerable to be safe, as safe as they can be. And isn't this great? There has been a reward for all of our staying home, for all of our distancing. And after three long months, really long months, we're COVID-free, at least for the moment. I really hope that's still true today when you're watching this. But even if it's not, We've experienced the payoff of taking care of each other, the reward for it, and we will again, right? We will again. With everything that's been happening these last three months, there's been a common thread that's run through the community. We have protested. We have grieved. We have isolated. We've called out, oh Lord, how long together over so many things in these last few months. Because we know that when one person in our society hurts, we all hurt. Because we're in this together, because we share a human bond that is so aware of our interconnectedness, that my well-being depends on your well-being, and your well-being depends on my well-being. And there is no way to separate those things and to say, I'm okay. I live in a COVID-free two square meters. <laughs> Too bad you don't. Um, there's no way to sort those things out, is there? I mean, it just, we're in this together. And there's no way to be in it alone. Absolutely none. So let's talk about the gospel reading for today. The reading today talks about being rewarded. And so I want to ask you this. Would you think for a moment about a time or a thing that makes you feel really rewarded, where you would say the feeling you get from doing it is, yes, I feel rewarded. 
So think about that. If you're wa willing to, write it in the comments section, just a quick little what it is that makes you feel rewarded. And think too about why. Why does that particular thing give you that sense of, ah, oh, yes, reward, right? Um, and again, write it in the comment section if you wish, but think about it whether you're writing it down or not. One of the things that came to my mind instantly as I was writing that question, and of course you have to answer it for yourself, right, is cooking and baking for my family. Pretty simple thing. Now, I like cooking and baking. I do. But really, it's not the cooking and baking that gives me the rewarded feeling. It's not even having dinner there that gives me the rewarded feeling. It's because my family very often walks into the kitchen and goes, oh, cool, we're having whatever. And they light up. And I always get a thank you. And every once in a while, I even get a kiss on the cheek. And it's that, it's that love that flows back to me when, oh, there's cookies. Uh, or, uh, or we're having something people like um, that, that, that just absolutely makes it worthwhile for me. And that's where the feeling of reward comes from. The love that flows back to me. It's all about me. Hmm. Hmm. I know that's not true for everyone. For some of you, the things that leave you feeling rewarded are not necessarily about the love that's flowing back to you, but about the intrinsic value of the thing itself. Perhaps whatever your cooking is, you actually love to do that thing deeply. Or perhaps it's the effect that that thing has on the world that you offer that makes you feel rewarded. Um, you know, the word reward kind of implies that you are doing something and you're getting something back for it that's good, right? Yeah. But a quick reading of this gospel will lead you astray because... In the life of Jesus, that's not how reward works. <laughs> I know there's a common way of understanding theology out there that says, you know, if I am a good person, if I live a life that is godly and holy, I will get good things. Kind of like my baking. I bake, I get the love. But Jesus says it doesn't quite work that way. And I want to be really clear about this because the gospel reading, if you read it quickly, will make you think, oh, yes, I do this. I get good things. Not quite. Not quite. We're going to unpack it a little before we read it. So this is still part of the reading about Jesus telling his disciples. You are one of his disciples, by the way, telling his disciples what their mission is in the world. We started two weeks ago when we, Jesus talked about sending his, mis mission, ah, sending his disciples out into the world and that their mission, our mission, is to preach the good news, spread the love of God, to heal the sick, and to cast out demons. He also threw in there raising the dead, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, perhaps we might be able to raise ideas and, and values that, and, but yeah, anyway, I'm going, on, I'm going down a rabbit hole that isn't in my script, so I should stop now. Um, forgive me. <laughs> in between that and the reading that we had last week, we skipped over this really wow piece of scripture that talks about how when we do those things, we are not going to be rewarded but rather we should expect to be persecuted. We should expect horrible things to happen to us when we are truly living out the mission of Jesus Christ. That is probably written in a context where that was largely true. Um, I'm not really sure that's our context today, but I really want to say that because I want you to understand that Jesus is not saying, if you do the mission well, you get a good reward. And then we went on last week to read a piece of the uh, next piece of that same uh, scripture that talked about how we're all equal in this. That in God's mission, there is no sort of me being superior to you and offering you um, my mission. Oh, I'm going to save you. How wonderful is that for you? You know what I mean? Um, we're all equal. 
None of us is more special than anybody else. So go out there and live the mission of Jesus Christ in a way that shows that you know you are no more special than the person that you are working with, healing, sharing the good news with. Today we finish this off, and we're still talking about the mission. So keep that in mind, because it isn't specifically mentioned. It's assumed you've read the first part of the passage. Remember the mission. Go into the world. Take nothing with you. Speak of love and hope of God. Heal people, cast out evil. That's what you and I have been asked to do. Again, I want to say, be really careful of reward theology that says, if you do those things, good things are going to happen to you. A quick look at the life of Jesus would probably convince you that's not how things work. But if you read this passage quickly without paying attention, you might be left with that impression. This passage does not say that if you go out into the world and preach the good news of Jesus Christ in whatever form, I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about telling people about Jesus, but offering them the love and the grace and the hope that is your faith um, because you are a person of God. If you do those things, this passage does not say that you will be rewarded. It does not say that if you are an awesome disciple of Jesus, you will have a good life. In fact, as I said, it says you're be, going to be persecuted. And it does not say that if you are a good disciple of Jesus Christ, that you will get a golden ticket to heaven. That's not in this either. What it does say is that if you are a good disciple of Jesus Christ, if you do this mission of of spreading love and healing and casting out evil, if you do that well, there will be huge rewards for the other people, not for you. Hmm. Hmm. Picture my kid's face when I bake cookies. My kids are adults, by the way. I'm talking like they're little kids, they're not. Picture their face when you pull cookies out of the oven and they come in and go, oh, chocolate chip. And I say, oh, those are for the church. You can't have any. That's you. <laughs> Does it matter? Yeah, it matters. It matters because when we go out and live the love of God in the world, it's not about you and it's not about me. And, you know, I feel a little bit like the, the reward story I shared with you in the beginning is kind of the, the don't do this <laughs> because I made it all about me. It isn't. It's about God's love flowing out from you, from you to another, to another, to another, flowing out into the world, flowing out freely, but going outward from you. And definitely, you are a part of that love of God. Absolutely, a key part of it. But good things will happen for other people when you live the mission of Jesus Christ. So if you are a great disciple of Christ and you spark something holy in someone else and they give a cup of cold water to the least of these the passage says because you have shared your heart then that's the one that gets the reward <laughs> good things happen not necessarily material things by the way but life is better somehow once we have lived that mission life becomes better for others and there's where the reward is. Other people also find love and hope and grace and forgiveness and all those good things. That's where the reward is. The point is that the promised reward is not payment for a job well done. And it does not flow back to you except as an added bonus and hooray when it does. But it flows outward. It builds the community of God where love is everywhere. And how great is that? So after a very long build-up, let me read the passage to you. I'm reading from Matthew 10, verses 40 to 42. Jesus is speaking, by the way. So Jesus says, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, 
And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of the little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Hear what God is saying to you and to me through this scripture. Here's the problem. The problem is that you kind of get used to that satisfied feeling from doing good things in the name of Christ. And when you are used to that feeling, you look for it, right? But sometimes you look for it and you don't find it anymore. So what do you do? If it's all about the reward for you, you give up and go home. It's hard to sustain a lifelong discipleship if you need the reward all the time. The psalmist cried out, how long, O Lord? He wasn't feeling the love, not at all. But neither was he giving up and going home. He was in it for the long haul. He trusted, he deeply trusted that God was present with him even in the midst of all of this that was happening to him. And he trusted that God was ready to hear his lament. And there was no doubt in his troubled soul that he was going to walk away. That wasn't going to happen. His life of faith was going badly, and yet he was living his life of faith. So for those of you who've been involved in Black Lives Matter, for those of you that are feeling the rewards of staying the blazes home right now. You know, there is a reward to it now. You know, if you've been standing up with our black, brown, indigenous, marginalized, in any way, neighbors, and crying out how long, there's a momentum in the movement right now, isn't there? There's a, there's a yeah, we're in this together and we're going to accomplish something feeling that is so incredibly rewarding. But when the media attention turns somewhere else, when the protests and rallies are no longer happening, where will you be? Will you still be there, working towards a better life for people who are marginalized, for people who are experiencing prejudice and racism? And when, because they say it's going to happen, hopefully it won't. I love it when people are wrong on these things. When we start to get new cases of COVID, as people begin to move around a little more and open up a little more, and when possibly the government tells us, please go back home. You know, last April, we felt good about it, didn't we? We felt like we were really doing something for our community. But when we're asked to go back home, will we be feeling quite as gracious? Will we be faithfully ready to uh, once again protect one another? Or will we, the faithful, move on to something else and complain about the fact that we're stuck at home again? You know, my friends, with the protests around racism right now, we know that until all people in our society are treated as though they are worthy of respect and until they are free, none of us are worthy of respect or free. Our society is not worthy of respect until everyone is. But it's so much easier to embrace that when there is reward for doing that. Please, my friends, remain for the long haul, even when the rewards are gone. And same with COVID. You know, if we have to go back home, let's do it gracefully, knowing that it is the faithful thing to do, even if it no longer feels like, yes, I feel like I'm doing something for the community good, and that's a nice feeling. Even when we feel like enough is enough. My friends, your faith does matter. It makes such a difference. 
And perhaps it matters most on those days when there is absolutely no reward for doing what is right. It matters most on those days when it becomes a huge pain in the behind. Because on those days, someone else needs that reward. On those days, the community needs you more than ever because perhaps others aren't stepping up. There is great reward in looking after the well-being of others. But on those days when it feels the least rewarding, that's when the world needs us most. So go out into the world, my friends. Speak the truth that God's love is everywhere and for all people. And remember that the only way that the world can be healthy on so many levels is if we all live the love of God every day of our lives. Heal the world. Cast out its demons. Do it when all kinds of love isn't flowing back to you for your actions. Do it on those days when you feel like the psalmist. Nothing is going right. The psalm writer who was broken and suffering some horrible injustice ends with these words. He's speaking to God and he says, I trusted in your steadfast love and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Salvation. Being saved from something bad and lifted up into something good and holy comes in so many different forms. The mission that Jesus gives the people of God is to trust God and to go out and make that salvation real for the people of this world. And the reward for our efforts? If we do it right, that reward is a better world for us all. How great is that? Amen. Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my peace.
Friends, it is a privilege that we have to share in God's mission to adapt and to be responsive to the needs around us, as Sarah so eloquently spoke about this morning. As we offer all of our gifts, whether it is financial time, financial time or talent, know that your offerings go to support the work of our churches and the work of Jesus' mission in the world. So let us take a moment and express our gratitude to God for all that God has given us. Let us pray. The currency that we ask you to bless this morning, O God, is the currency of ourselves in time, in talent, and in treasure. Take what we freely give as living expressions of our faith, blessing us for your mission in the world. Amen. Friends, I would invite you now as we prepare our hearts and our minds to center ourselves in connection with God in our time of community prayer as we listen to the words of Come Touch Our Hearts with Maureen. Friends, our prayer today is uh, kind of responsive, and so if you remember, and if you would like to say this, when I say, God, hear our prayer, please feel free to say, in your love, answer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray for the faithful all over the world, that all who love you may be united in your service. We pray for the church for the people of Rockingham United and Fairview United as we enter into the summer season. Bless each one, O God, with your compassionate spirit. We pray for the Church Universal and her mission. Supply us with all of your spiritual blessings that strengthen and uphold us, that we might release love and joy and hope and peace and forgiveness wherever we go. Keep us always a people of justice seekers for your name's sake, O God. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for the peoples and leaders of the nations, that they may be reconciled to one another in pursuit of your justice and peace. We pray for the world. We pray, O oh God, for a world that would see those things dismantled, that keep people oppressed, that all may live equitably, and that all would have enough. God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for all who suffer from prejudice, greed, or violence, that the heart of humanity may warm with your tenderness. We pray especially, O God, for all prisoners of politics and religion, and for all refugees around the world. We pray, O God, for all who are oppressed. God, in our prayer, in your love, answer. We pray for all in need, by reason of famine or flood or earthquake, that whoever is experiencing these things, that they might know the hope of your faithfulness through the help of others. God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for the land, the sea, and the sky, we pray that we may live with respect in creation and with our neighbors and use your gifts with reverence. We pray, O oh God, for the earth and all the people who live on her. 
God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for all who suffer the pain of sickness, loneliness, fear, or loss, that those whose names are in our hearts, in the hearts of others, or known to you alone, may receive strength and courage. We pray, O God, for those in need and all who are affected by COVID-19. God, hear our prayer and in your love answer. God of compassion, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy now and forever as we pray together the way Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. into the world looking for Christ in all that you meet and let those people see Christ in you as well. Go into the world looking for God's blessing and letting God's blessing flow through you out into the world so that others may be richly blessed as well. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen. <laughs>